were listening to the PGX for Pharmacists podcast, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Pharmacogenomics is the study of how genes affect a person's response to drugs. This revolutionary science combines pharmacology and genomics to develop effective, safe medications and doses that will be tailored to a person's genetic makeup. There's no better healthcare provider position to leverage the analytical power of pharmacogenomics to provide more effective medication therapies and outcomes than a clinical pharmacist. And now, here's the host of the PGX for Pharmacists podcast, pharmacist, researcher, and national pharmacogenetics expert, Ken Sternfield. To the PGX for Pharmacy podcast on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. My name is Ken Sternfeld and I am the host of the show. I wanted to welcome you and tell you about an exciting, distinguished guest we have with us this afternoon. I'd like to welcome Dr. David Kaiser uh, from Manchester University. Uh, David is the uh, professor and director of pharmacogenomics uh, of education at Manchester University in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Previously, he was uh, the chair of the Department of Pharmaceutical and Biomedical Sciences at the Rabbe College of Pharmacy in Ohio Northern University. Uh, Dr. Kaiser received his Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy from the University of Toledo and his PharmD from the Ohio State University, Obuckeyes. He completed a fellowship in therapeutic drug monitoring and pharmacokinetics at Ohio State. And really beyond David's uh, academic experience, he's worked in the pharmaceutical industry at Burr's Welcome, which now is a uh, GlaxoSmithKline, where he was a research scientist in pharmacokinetics and drug metabolism. David, welcome to the PGX Pharmacy Podcast. Well, thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me. I uh, look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you. It's uh, I had a short list of people that I liked, uh, wanted on my show uh, when I started this a few months back. Uh, there was uh, Jonas Salk and uh, Adam Curie and, and you, <laughs> because, because uh, I really feel that you are a true thought leader in the area of pharmacogenetics and are leading the cause to education uh, for the future pharmacist who could really make a career out of pharmacogenomics. So I really am very glad that you decided to, uh, uh, to join us. Well, thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. There are a number of great groups around the country that are working on different aspects of pharmacogenomics from the you know, the benchtop researchers to the uh, educators to the implementers uh, all over the place. And that's a really important part of this. But uh, it's all a big group effort. And it's, it's a great thing to see uh, for society because I think it's going to have a huge impact uh, on how uh, patients are treated going forward. Well, we agree. And uh, what first attracted me to uh, Manchester, and I guess I reached out to you, I guess it was almost a year ago when Manchester launched the first dedicated pharmacogenetics master's degree program. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, in May of 2016, actually, we uh, had our first uh, cohort uh, class of master's students. It's it's a one-year program for the on-campus course. And we had 11 students in that cohort. Of of 11 students, they they had uh, really a a great success in finding some some jobs across the country, uh, everything from uh, whole genome sequencing companies to translational uh, information companies to uh, major institution research laboratories and some pharmacogenetic testing companies. So we we're really thrilled to see those folks uh, go out into uh, you know the industry and and help uh, help move it forward. We then decided that the growth really needed to be uh, in. Um, I think more of the professional realm with pharmacists, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, genetic counselors, and, and, and folks that are really out there working with patients. And the way to increase that um, opportunity for education was to start an online master's program. We launched that in January of 2018. So we've got those two programs going on, and we have an additional program that uh, we are really excited about. It's a dual degree program, so our pharmacy students now can have the opportunity uh, to graduate with both the master's degree in pharmacogenomics and their PharmD degree. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we have been putting a lot of effort into this area. 
that is that is so great that you are kind of fusing from even even in the undergraduate or the the pharmacy course of study to give them a pathway to a career because our listeners always question is there a business out there is there a professional spot for me as a pharmacist in this area and you're really proving that that there are positions available uh, for these graduates and and it really is an evolving huge future opportunity for people who are moving in this direction. Yeah, there was a survey of pharmacy leaders, and uh, and forgive me, I can't uh, quote exactly when it was done. It was within the last two to three years, uh, really through the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists, and they looked at uh, the idea of pharmacogenomic dosing services, and about 80% of the leaders thought that within about the next five years, roughly, there would be a pharmacogenomic dosing service at an academic medical center in their area. So, uh, it, you know, it's kind of taken the same path, Ken, that um, pharmacokinetics took back in the 1970s and 80s. When we had the technology back then to look at drug concentrations, uh, it wasn't something that was done as a standard of care uh, in pharmacy. And so we started to see these pharmacokinetic dosing services or therapeutic drug monitoring services really start to flourish. And pharmacists were leading, you know, leading those, those, uh, those services. And as time went on, certainly pharmacokinetics became a standard of, of education across pharmacies such that, uh, you know, the, the pharmacist was doing this, uh, whether or not they were in a, a therapeutic drug monitoring or a pharmacokinetic dosing service. So it became a real standard. I think we're going to see the same thing happen with pharmacogenetics and genomics where the technology came along to look at the DNA. We agree, and that's why the clinical aspect of your track for the uh, for the online and the on campus program really gives FOMDs and you know an opportunity to find positions because it's about learning, but it's also about putting that knowledge into uh, the ability to monetize that education. and And we see the great applications here with what we're doing by incorporating pharmacogenetics and having a pharmacist be a critical part of that evolution at the physicians by collaborating with them to bring this new technology to more patients. Yeah, I really think that uh, the pharmacists that uh, have pharmacogenomics knowledge and, and again, the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists uh, put out a statement that kind of described what the baseline pharmacist responsibilities would be in pharmacogenomics and then also the specialist. Along with that, uh, some pharmaco uh, genomics uh, competency statements were uh, revisited and updated and published uh, in early 2017. So I think what's going to happen is as these folks go out into the uh, into the workforce or pick up this uh, expertise as they're in the workforce, they're going to become leaders in this because there's such a gap and there's such a need for this to be uh, um, implemented. So it's not a matter of folks going out and, um, you know, kind of uh, – trudging along a path, it's going to be blazing that path. And and that's where pharmacy is going to even take it further. So it's very exciting times. It is, because when you can be on the super highway in your profession and not be on the side of the road just trying to catch up, you really can be not only a thought leader, but from a, from a perspective professionally and financially, you're moving yourself forward for yourself and your family. So uh, we, we agree, and, and it's just so so thrilled that there are these kind of programs available uh, for people who are looking to go outside the box and do something a little forward thinking. Yeah, I might add that, uh, you know, there are a number of opportunities um, uh, to pursue, you know, any number of different paths. For instance, a master of business administration or health informatics. So this, this whole idea of having pharmacogenomics is, is unique from the aspect of getting an increased number of trained people out there. Right now, uh, the pathway to this is get your PharmD degree, you know, go ahead and, and apply and, and get your application in for a PGY1, a postgraduate year one general residency, and then pursue a postgraduate year two residency specifically in pharmacogenomics. And there are a limited number of slots for those positions. Uh, there's uh, uh, only about three or four places in the country that, that offer the PGY2 type of experience. And with the number of graduates we have, uh, it really is a, uh, a real uh, competitive atmosphere to get to that PGY2 specific 
pharmacogenomics uh, residency. Not that getting into the master's program is not competitive, but what we're doing is really increasing the number of people that are out there with that expertise. It's, it's needed. We're, we're, move, we're moving kind of slow uh, down this path. We need to increase the, the rate of, of graduation of folks with this expertise. So the, the program, which, you know, the traditional program, the brick and mortar program is a, is a one year course and the, and the prerequisites for people who would be interested in, in this course are what? Yeah, so it is a one year course and it's, uh, not, um, in the same, uh, vein as a typical academic year. There is really no summer break. So, uh, if, Somebody applies to this program and gets in from the standpoint of having a bachelor's degree in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, or related science, or if they're professional and they have a, a PharmD degree, uh, MD, um, nursing degree, uh, with, again, that science background, they can pursue this one-year intense program and get out on the market uh, relatively quick where a number of master pro- programs are, you know, are uh, at least uh, two years. Uh, so that's the brick and mortar, as you say, the brick and mortar on campus program. Uh, we recognize that folks are out there um, committing themselves uh, first and format, foremost to their families and their their personal lives. And so to try to, to incorporate a master's degree is, is a pretty big endeavor. So what we've done is we've put the courses into seven-week uh, modules, if you will, so that individuals can take seven weeks a focus on that course then take a week off and if they want to pursue another seven week module within a semester they can do that but we have a couple of different starting times for that january and august so it gives folks a chance to put together a, a, a sequence of courses that get them through the program and they can complete it in as little as two years but as long as five years so the point is that they are given that time to really um, do the short um, seven week sessions but also time to make sure that they can enjoy their families, also, uh, you know, do the work they do in their employment. Well, that's great because I'm coming out of, you know, some, some years in retail, you see very, very young, dedicated PharmDs who uh, go through school, start working, uh, start a family, and then coming back to work is a challenge uh, with, uh, in the retail environment. So you're kind of creating almost like a mommy and me, not to say it's uh, just for, for women, but you're creating a lifestyle opportunity for someone to continue to focus on their profession while also really growing their family and meeting their, their lifestyle needs. I think that's really the nice thing to do uh, and a good thing to do for someone on an educational pathway. Yeah, we hope it gives people options. That's, that's the whole point. We just feel that, as you do, that pharmacists are uh, going to be the leaders in this area And they're leaders uh, in research, they're leaders in development of clinical guidelines along with physicians and and other folks, Uh, but pharmacists are are the experts with drug-drug interactions, and now they're going to be experts with drug-gene interactions. We, be, we believe that. And one of the things to help all of us towards that, that goal is to set up partnerships and strategic relationships with others in the industry so that our voice and our vision kind of becomes more unified. Uh, I was reading about uh, 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 a partnership you have with RX Genomics, uh, where they provide some of the training uh, either on campus or through these courses. Can you speak towards that a little bit so the listeners hear that? Sure. So the... Uh RX Genomics Partnership is really for online certification program, uh, so it provides 16 hours of, uh, of uh, ACP accredited uh, continuing education. Uh, it's co-provided uh, currently by the American Pharmacists Association, and again, it's, it's really strictly online, and it really is kind of a minimal competency type of certification program, certainly not anywhere near the depth that uh, an individual would need to become a uh, you know a leader in putting uh, forward, say, a program or implementation program that they would get in the master's program. Absolutely. Uh, but that's been a really a really um, um, uh, important uh, um, start to pharmacist education. There's a number of certification programs out there also that that if pharmacists want that level of training, they really should pursue. We agree. Uh, you know, as a pharmacist, you always hear certain buzzwords and, uh, you know, drug efficacy and, and things like that. But in, when you talk about pharmacogenetics, you're really talking about uh, avoiding drug ineff- You can't even pronounce it. Uh, ineff- inefficiencies. Uh, can you talk about how the pharmacogenetic um, 
testing helps avoid those things and helps push the uh, drug regimen down the pathway that it should be going. Yeah, certainly. So um, the, the data is a little bit old. It's really from the early 2000s, but unfortunately hasn't changed all that much. Uh, drug inefficacy is, is seen in about 38 to maybe up to 75% or more uh, of patients who get certain medications across therapeutic areas. So the whole idea here is to avoid this inefficacy early in therapy. We want to get the patient on the right drug early on and avoid the whole trial and error of, you know, let's try this medication, it doesn't work, let's try that medication, it doesn't work, let's try the third. And, and that has some big implications, first and foremost, for the patient. For instance, if a patient is not responding to initial uh, antidepressant medication, there are dire consequences that, that can be um, um, occurring in that setting. But also there's a individual and then a health system-wide cost to drug uh, inefficacy and trial and error dosing. So the whole idea would be to identify patients who have a um, – a better chance of responding to a certain medication early in therapy. That's one of the two major areas where pharmacogenomics can really have an impact. And, you know, with everyone's goal of provider status and with the healthcare industry moving to a value-based system, if we as pharmacists can be directly involved with lowering the cost of healthcare in a measurable uh, manner, it really is, is a pathway to provider status by being a leader in lowering the cost and, of course, then you get into the adverse drug reactions, which, of course, kill people, sadly. Uh, so we're really um, a major, major contributor to, um, to the healthcare industry. We just need to step up and do it and not just talk about it. That's why this is so important. Sure. You mentioned the adverse drug reaction side of things. That's the other area. So drug inefficacy and then adverse drug reaction. In the United States in 2017, there were over 1.8 million adverse drug reactions. I think over 900,000 of those were serious adverse drug reactions that killed more than 160,000 people. So, you know, you talk about the cost. Uh, that's certainly a cost of lives and quality of life, but also the cost associated with treating folks with adverse drug reactions. Yep. Or for, for those, again, that don't, don't respond. You know, a good example, and we always talk about this, um, example with clopidogrel and, and cytochrome P452 C19. But in the acute coronary syndrome patient where they've had stent placements and uh, other uh, interventions, uh, the antiplatelet eff efficacy is really important. And if we lose that efficacy or if we don't have that efficacy, then you're looking at if the patient survives another, uh, another heart attack due to a stent thrombosis, uh, the cost of treating that. It may be say, forty to $50,000 to treat a stent thrombosis, where the cost of testing is, you know, it's coming way down. And uh, so much so that uh, much of the, of the paying right now for uh, pharmacogenetic testing is really self-paying coming out of the patient's pocket because they see the value in it. Yeah, and, and the value of saving lives cannot be understated. Uh, we speak on this show many times about the fact that adverse drug reactions are the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, and there's certainly a tremendous amount of media attention on opioid abuse and the horrific uh, challenges and, and loss of life in those areas, but adverse drug reactions kill more people. So we, as pharmacists here at RxVIP, and we feel for the industry, we should be talking a singular voice, and we should all be talking about how we could reduce adverse drug reactions, saving people's lives, and of course, ultimately saving a huge amount of money to the healthcare industry. Um, I get a number of calls uh, or, or, you know, information. They're saying, what do I need to be? What, what competencies do I need to be uh, a pharmacist who's involved in uh, PGX testing and pharmacogenomics? Can you speak towards that? Because I think it's um, something that needs to be uh, spoken about because people think that they can't get into this when, in fact, they can. Yeah, so when we look at the education of, of uh, folks across health health profession across health professions, we we see the, a lack of the uh, education in pharmacogenomics. There are some basic genetics that individuals may have, but the whole idea of putting together um, genetics relative to how a patient responds to medication is really something that is just now being required by accrediting bodies. So the American Council for Pharmacy Education didn't require the subject matter in schools of pharmacy until July of 2016. 
Now, that's not to say that pharmacy didn't have the vision to start educating their their uh, students earlier. Certainly, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, many schools started educating uh, their students about pharmacogenomics. In 2002, there was a set of competencies that were put in place by uh, a group from the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. Those competency statements were updated uh, over the last number of years and published in early 2017, and they're available from the Genetics Genomics Competency Center from the National Institutes of Health, the National Human Genome Research Institute. And so the competencies that are in there, there's four categories for the pharmacists. There's basic genetic knowledge, there's disease and genetics. I think the biggest one is the category, of course, of pharmacogenomics. And within that realm, we need to be uh, looking at uh, the area of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and how uh, genetics, uh, you know, really affects what the body does to the drug, the whole ADME scheme, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Now, for many people, the whole area of pharmacokinetics is really daunting uh, going through school, but it really is our expertise and understanding this relative to drug-drug interactions that can help us understand drug-gene interactions. We have the same kind of issues. As an example, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, the uh, SSRIs, a couple of, of them in particular, fluoxetine, paroxetine, and, and those drugs being inhibitors of CYP2D6, major drug inhibition, and CYP2D6 is uh, responsible for met metabolizing many different drugs. But that drug-drug interaction, which pharmacists are really aware of, along with many, many others, of course, is very similar to what we would see in a Tip 2D6 poor metabolizer who can't metabolize drugs as efficiently as a normal metabolizer would, uh, would metabolize drugs. So we see these same kind of interactions. It's a pharmacist expertise and that competency of understanding how changes in um, what the body does to the drug with kinetics alters the exposure to the drug, whether that exposure is increased when you have an active drug given to somebody who has intermediate or poor metabolism or lower exposure to a drug when somebody has increased, so rapid or ultra-rapid metabolism for an active drug. Those, those things are in place right now in pharmacists, ingrained in them in drug-drug interactions. We move it over to drug-gene interactions and we apply it. Then there's a fourth category for competency, and that's really in the area of ethical, legal, and social implications. Now, pharmacists are, are certainly professional from the standpoint of um, holding patients' information and privacy uh, close to the chest and, and not, uh, not uh, letting that information be used inappropriately. And when we have genetic testing now, of course, we learn not only about the patient, but about the patient's relatives. So those areas, there's four different areas, but the pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, and the ethical, legal, and social implications are, are huge uh, competency needs for pharmacists. Well, thank you for sharing that, that valuable information. Are there current guideline developments that you see things in the pipeline, you being, you know, so directly involved? Are there things that you see coming in that area for current guidelines and the development of them? So there's a number of groups that uh, have worked to put together guidelines. Uh, consistently in the U.S., the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, has worked to produce evidence-based guidelines and this is a group, I think now well over 200 people from around the world, although it's based out of uh, Tennessee at St. Jude's. And there's a, an oversight committee of folks from Florida and, and many, uh, many other places. But the, uh, the guidelines are vetted, um, um, evidence-based guidelines. I think now there's 22 or 23 guidelines that cover 40, roughly 40 to 50 medications, and there are more guidelines coming. And so you can expect to see um, some very concise uh, information that's going to help pharmacists and other clinicians move, move this forward. The guidelines typically have a couple of summary tables that talk about um, the genetic side of things and then recommendations for the drug gene interactions and that they're very efficient. And those guidelines are available uh, in a number of different places. You can get them from the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium uh, website, uh, that's uh, cpicpgx.org. You can get them through guidelines.gov, uh, and you can also uh, get them through uh, the journal Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. 
There's a Dutch group, there's a French group, there's a Canadian group. Uh, the Dutch group has a, a guideline that they published in 2011 that had, I think, 50-some drugs, 53 or 55 drugs covered by genetics. But they haven't updated their guidelines in English uh, recently. Uh, so CPIC, uh, the CPIC, um, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium group, they're, they're the ones that are really leading the way with these guidelines. David, if you would be kind enough to forward some of that information to, to me, I'll make sure that some of that gets included in some of the program notes because that information is so important and so timely, and you providing this to our listeners is, is very, very helpful. Um, if someone out there listening wants to learn more about the Manchester programs, uh, and again, who wouldn't, uh, wh- how do they contact you? What's the best way to learn more about the program and to uh, find out how this could work for them? Sure. The, the efficient way would be to uh, send an email to pgx at manchester.edu. Uh, so pgx, uh, the abbreviation for pharmacogenomics at manchester.edu. Of course, you could also go to www.manchester.edu slash pgx and look at a website also. That's wonderful. And if you will allow me to invite you again on this show, uh, I almost look at our dialogues from the time that you and I started talking to continuing here to be an evolution. And it's an education for me. Uh, it's an education for our listeners. So if you're available, uh, you're, you have an open invitation uh, to speak to our listeners on the PGX for Pharmacists podcast because you truly are a thought leader and someone who I enjoy uh, having conversations with anytime. So I wanted to thank you so much for uh, joining us with our listeners. And um, our goal is to kind of do a little junior master's program, because as you know, from my dialogue with you, we really focus on uh, the PharmDs when they get started, to put this thought process of pharmacogenetics in their minds from the very beginning, from their their IPIs, their APIs, their introduction, introduction to our profession. So, you know, we're going to develop and have uh, a kind of our own junior master's program. We call it RxVIP Cares 365 because we believe every day a pharmacist should be focusing on lowering the risk of adverse drug reactions and leading them on a pathway to provider status. So, again, I wanted to thank you personally and professionally for joining us here today. And um, one last uh, comment to our listeners. We're going to start something where you can ask us questions because the topics of this show, this is your show. This is something we want to make sure that we're talking to the things that our listeners want to. So you can send us your questions and we'll answer them on, on future shows. We'll have future guests on. If you ask us to do that, you can uh, send it to uh, at RxVIPKen or at PGX4RX. Uh, of course, the main handle for at the pharmacy podcast for anything having to do with pharmacy podcast is also a handle you should use. So uh, I wanted to thank all the listeners. I wish everyone uh, a wonderful day. And again, thank you to David Kaiser for being a guest here on the PGX for Pharmacy podcast. Thank you, Ken.